Today, uh, I want to talk to you guys about how we are marked by Jesus Christ. Um, and, and I want to talk about this from a perspective of, of a very familiar text, um, knowing first that, that his scars leave or have left an impression on all of us. Anyone who has said, Jesus is my Lord, understands this concept. Because you can't go forward, you can't continue on being who you once were when you have seen the scars, when you come to know who Jesus Christ is. In this particular sermon, I want, I want to surface a couple of things, and I want you guys to, as I'm talking through this, en envision this, a man, a very human being, a, a, a person with scars on their hands, with scars on their side. But I want you also to know that Jesus Christ was marred beyond recognition. When we read scripture and we say, Lord, let me see your hands. Let me see your side. I begin to wonder, did that crown of thorns not pierce his head? And did that not leave an impression? Did the amount of whips that he took to his back not leave scars on his back? Envision that for just a moment. And I don't want you to think about this. Every one of us is marked by an encounter that we have with the living Christ. Every one of us is marked by the encounter that we have with Jesus Christ. There was a man who had a demon-possessed son. This man wants to see Jesus Christ. He knows that the only way his son could be delivered from this demon would be to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. What are the religious people telling him? If you're not familiar with the story, it's going to be important for you to go and look to see this story in Scripture because the religious people are telling him to go away, to leave Jesus alone. The religious people are telling him, there's nothing that can be done for your son. Go away. He's been that way since he was born. Listen, he was that way for many, many, many years. His son would oftentimes have these fits and fall into fire. What do you think his body looked like? And yet this man fights through every single person who has told him to go away. And he presses on and he presses in and he says, I, I have to see Jesus. I have to show him my son because he can heal him. And Jesus looks at him as he comes through the crowd and he says, and he says one thing to him. If you believe, anything is possible. Now I want you to hear what he says in response. Lord, I believe. Lord, help my unbelief. How many times have we come to the Lord and said, Lord, I believe. Oh, God, help my unbelief. In that moment, Jesus looks at his son, casts out this demon. Everybody thinks that he's dead because he's laying there like he's dead. And Jesus reaches down grabs him by the hand, and lifts him up and says, rise. That man was marked. For the rest of his life, he was marked. The father, as much as that son, were left marked for the rest of their life. What stories did they tell their neighbors, their friends, their family, their coworkers? Eternally marked by the living Christ. But he's not the only one. He was struggling with his belief, right? He says, Lord, help me believe. Help my unbelief. Let's talk about Peter. Peter, before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me three times. <laughs> no, Lord, not me. And I am on fire for you. I've seen it all. Let's go. How many times have we been in those shoes? Lord, I'm on fire for you. I'm ready to go serve your kingdom. And 
And then here comes the enemy. And all he does is this. Go ahead, trip. And you stumble over his foot. You say, Lord, what happened? I was on fire for you. What it was at one time. Weren't you that guy who was with that? You were with that, that man, weren't you? Me? No, never, ever. He's a, he's a man, right? A, a man of God, we'll call him. He's most afraid of a little girl. Because the little girl comes to him and he says, weren't you also with that Jew? Weren't you with him? Get away from me. And he hears that rooster crowing. Oh, Lord, help my unbelief. He's embarrassed. He's ashamed. He wants to run and hide and never come out again. And then he sees the resurrected Christ. When we see this in in Scripture, we see a Peter who is no longer jumping into things headlong. We see one who says, wait a minute. I'm going to go verify this for myself. They're on a boat. They're fishing. And all the apostles, the disciples are there, and they are cheering. They're saying, there's the Lord. There's the Lord. There's the Lord. And what does Peter do? Where? Show me. Where is he? And he looks out, and there he is on the shore. Now, Peter didn't have any clothes on. He was out there fishing, probably just in his underwear or swimming trunks, whatever, whatever we want to call it. He throws on his tunic, and he jumps in that water, and man, he's making a beeline to Jesus Christ because nobody's experience, nobody will tell him who that Lord is. He's going to go see for himself. Peter is left marked, completely marked by Jesus Christ. Paul, on the road to Damascus, this man isn't following Jesus. This man has every reason to persecute anyone who believes in Jesus Christ. And the Lord flicks him off of his horse. There he is on his knees. And he is left blind. For three days, he can't see. He doesn't eat and he doesn't drink. Paul was left in a state of of Desperate help. I need help. And it was caused by none other than Jesus Christ. But then Jesus sends someone to speak to him and heals him. And Jesus, excuse me, Paul has this encounter with Jesus where he receives the full gospel from Jesus Christ. From that point forward, he is marked, eternally marked. He goes and he preaches the gospel everywhere. Fourteen years later, he was curious. I got to know. I got to know. Lord, am I doing the right thing? Am I preaching the right way? And he goes and he submits his teachings to the elders. And it says that everything that he had been teaching was true. Everything. He was left forever marked by Jesus. Now, these are the marks of uh, left on people, Jesus marking people. But church, I got to tell you, you yourselves, you yourselves are marked with the scars of the Savior. And the scars that you are marked with are going to testify. Did you know that? That the scars that the Savior has imprinted on your life, his scars, will serve as your testimony. And your scars are going to tell the world of who Jesus Christ is. What have you been through? We sang about it, right? The lion and the lamb. The one who is conquering our battles. the Lion of Judah, who goes before us. And we sing it. Who can stand before the Lord Almighty? Who dares to stand before the Lord Almighty? 
So when the enemy comes and he sticks his foot out and we begin to stumble, we say, oh, God, oh, God, help my unbelief. There is something to be said about how we encounter Jesus Christ. Turn your Bibles with me, if you will, to John 20. And we'll start at verse 24. I wonder, and I have wondered for time, for some time, how it is that our life becomes a living testimony. Because we know that, I'm, that we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We're going to fall. And so if we place ourselves on a pedestal and, we're, and we say, well, we're going to be perfect, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. And not that sin triumphs over who we are, because we know that sin was conquered on the cross. Sin can't hold us as slaves anymore. But there's this thing about us, it's called flesh. And it's contrary to what the Spirit desires. Something that we encounter is uh, when we read this section of Scripture, many of us have identified Thomas with a very descriptive word. You guys know what it is? We say it's Doubting Thomas. That's the name we give him. I want you to see how you and I may not be so different from Thomas. John 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. This is why he's identified as Doubting Thomas. It is an incredibly bad rap. But he isn't any different than the ones before him. Listen, Jesus had risen. And the, and the disciples, his apostles, were having trouble believing. It wasn't just Thomas. Thomas was accustomed to the Judaic traditions. Thomas was accustomed to hearing about how people had encounters with divine beings. Open the Bible, look at the Old Testament, and how many people had encounters with angelic presences. This was common to them. Today, if one person raises their hand and says, I've seen an angel. Oh, he's charismatic. She's charismatic. Throw him out of the church. They've seen angels. Well, there's a difference. I don't worship an angel. I, I do not worship an angel. I worship the living Christ. But that angel is a minister. And oftentimes they're sending messages. Today in the church, if someone stands up and says, I have seen an angel, we say, get about. You couldn't possibly have seen an angel. It's a divine being. But wait a minute. Hold on a second. I thought God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. When did he stop operating that way? When did he stop sending messengers? He didn't. Thomas was accustomed to this. So it wasn't a surprise when, they, when the other disciples said to him, we've seen Jesus. We've seen him with our own eyes. He says, okay, cool. I want to see him. I want to see him. I want to see his nail-pierced hands. I want to see his side. And not only do I want to see it, I want to touch it. And one might say, well, maybe it was doubt. Or maybe 
Maybe. He was refusing to allow others to define his encounter with the risen Christ. Listen to what I just said. Maybe he was refusing to allow others to define how he encountered Jesus Christ. Is it possible that he wanted to have a personal experience with Jesus Christ? I don't want your experience. I want what he has for me. I want to see him. I want to touch him. I want to see my Lord, my God. That's what he's asking for. He's asking to see those nail-pierced hands. He's asking to touch it. Here's the thing. Those that told him about seeing the, the resurrected Christ had experienced it. Everyone else had seen Jesus. Everyone else in those disciples had that encounter with Jesus. And Thomas, all he is saying is, I've got to see it. I've got to see it. I want to have a personal experience with, the, with my risen Christ. There is a verse... Hebrews 3, 14 to 15. It's, it's not on the slides. But it says this. Today, today, today and tomorrow and every day, today. It's an active word, today, every day. If you hear the word, or if you hear the sound of the Lord's voice, do not harden your heart. This is the phrase that I wrestled with. This is a phrase that I wrestled with. Because we hear people say, well, I heard God tell me. Well, how'd you hear it? How'd you hear it? Was it his loud, thunderous voice? Pastor Mike, this is God. How did you hear him? But he says, today, if you hear the sound of his voice, do not harden your heart. The issue is that we tend to abuse that. God told me that I'm going to divorce my wife. And he's going to send me two for the price of one. That, hey, that's what God said. I had better have every single one of you open your Bible and say, Brother, show me where it says that in Scripture. Show me. Show me where Scripture says that God told you that. Because God is not going to contradict His Word. God is not going to go against the, His written Word. Some people are desperate to hear His voice. And He's been calling for a long time. He's been drawing, you for, drawing on you for a long time. But it doesn't sound like this loud and thunderous voice. It sounds more like, They got the pastor. Mike. Mike. Wake up. What? I'm tired. I'm really tired. I want to go back to sleep. I'm going back to sleep. Get out of bed. Lord, I'm tired. Can we do this like at 6 in the morning instead of 2 in the morning? I'm going back to sleep. Get out of bed. Yes, Lord. Whatever you say, Lord. Some of us are dying to have those encounters. But we fail to open his word. We fail to open the scripture. You want to hear his voice? Open his word. Seriously, open his Bible. And begin to study his word. I promise you, you'll begin to hear his voice. As it begins to soften your heart, you're going to hear his, the sound of his voice. And when you hear the sound of his voice, do not harden your heart as the ones in the rebellion did. Each of you, at one point in time, has heard his voice. If you have given your life to Christ, at some point in time you have heard his prompting, come, come, come to the cross, put it on the cross. What, give me your sin, put it on that cross, I have salvation for you. You've heard his voice. 
what happened? Why don't I hear his voice anymore? We've got to press in. We've got to have an encounter with the living God. If you are saved and you have heard the sound of his voice, you have been left marked for the rest of your life. You have been left marked for the rest of your life and no account from anyone of what they experienced with the Lord or how the Lord's dealt with them or how he blessed them or how he benefited them or how he spoke to them or revelation that he gave to them is going to suffice for your personal experience with the living Christ. None of it. Before I advance, how do I know if it's the Lord who's speaking to me? How do I know? It's a great question to ask. And I wouldn't call you doubting Thomas or doubting Chris. I would say that you're doing your homework. You're saying, I want to be sure. Open your Bible. Open your Bible. Is the word that you are hearing aligning with Scripture? I'm, I'm telling you right now, there is no prophetic word that is going to go against what Scripture speaks about. If you're receiving a prophetic voice, it's going to be grounded in Scripture. The thing is, I cannot and you cannot live on someone else's account. We cannot live in somebody else's encounter. If I want something from the living Christ, if I want something from the Lord, I cannot live on somebody else's encounter. John 20, verse 19. On the evening of the day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So here are the apostles. The mighty men of God, right? What are they doing? What are they doing? They're sitting in a room. They've locked all the doors. And they are terrified of what the religious, Jewish religious sect is about to do. They're terrified of what these religious leaders they had followed for a very long time were going to do. But I thought they believed in Jesus Christ. I thought they had received his word. As a matter of fact, when they are gathered in this room, listen to this. There was a woman. We'll say her name was Mary. Had gone to the tomb. And looking into the tomb, she was told, what are you looking for? The one you're looking for is no longer here. Go and tell them that he has risen. Go and tell them that he has risen. And this woman runs to the disciples and says, he's alive, he's alive, he is risen. Why didn't they believe him, believe her? Why didn't they believe her? Oh, but, but they did, because Scripture doesn't say that, that, that they didn't believe. Are you kidding me? If someone were to tell me, Jesus Christ is coming, he's on his way, he is alive, he is risen, I have seen him. What do you think my posture is going to be? Man, I'm kicking those doors open. I'm kicking those doors open, and I'm like, Lord, come, let's go. I got to see you. But they were cowering. Still, after having heard this word, they were cowering. They were terrified. Even after they had been told that Jesus had risen, what does it take for them to believe? What does it take for them to finally believe that Jesus was alive? Here's where, we, where it breaks down. Doubting Thomas got a bad rap for it. But check this out. They were not at peace. They did not believe until Jesus goes like this. Look, it's me. You see my nail-pierced hands? 
You see my side. It's me. In that moment, they were like, Lord, it's you. It re it's really you. They finally started to believe. But here's the situation. They were told he was going to raise from the dead before he died. They were told that by Jesus Christ. As he is being led to the cross, he tells them, this temple is going to be destroyed, and in three days I'm going to raise it. He tells them that. This woman Mary goes to the tomb and has an encounter with a divine being who tells them, go and tell them that he has risen. So they now have heard it a second time, at the very least. They heard it before his death. They heard it after he had risen. And they still had to see for themselves. Only after they finally come to believing that he is risen are they filled with the Holy Spirit. Now let me ask you, in the middle of our crisis, in the middle of our deepest, most difficult crisis, what will it take for you to believe that Jesus is reaching down and like that little boy telling you, arise, I've come to rescue you. What's it going to take? What's it going to take? Because if I come to you and I tell you, Jesus is here, Jesus wants to heal you, Jesus wants to deliver you, Jesus wants to see you lifted high, he wants to pick you up and put you in high places, what's it going to take? Jesus is conquering your addictions. Jesus is conquering the thing that has overcome you for so many years. What's it going to take? Or do you just come running to the cross and you say, yes, Lord, here I am. I'm ready to receive it. What's it going to take? In the middle of our crisis, no amount of anybody telling us anything will satisfy what only Jesus and what Jesus alone can impart. In these moments, we cannot live on someone else's experience. We cannot live on somebody else's encounter with the living Christ. We have to have this experience for ourselves. We want to know that he is here and he is fighting our battles. We want to know that our Christ is going before us. And so we begin to personalize our encounter with the, with the risen Christ. John 20, verse 25. <clears throat> so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I have to have this experience for myself. You guys had it. You guys had that experience. I will not be denied. I will not be denied. How many times have you come to the cross that way? How many times have you been in worship, in corporate worship, and you see how the Holy Spirit is beginning to touch people, and you say, man, I wish I could be there? How many times have you gotten upset because others are receiving from the Holy Spirit, and you're not, and so you just sit there and you say, well, this must not be real because I'm not seeing it. I don't, I'm not having that experience with the Holy Spirit. Nope, this isn't real. My question to you would be, why are you hardening your heart? Because if everybody else is, is receiving from the Holy Spirit what the Holy Spirit is giving, why not press in? Why not press in? Why not relentlessly pursue his presence? Why would you give in? Why would you be okay with not being in his presence? Why is that okay for us? It shouldn't be. Thomas is saying, you will not deny me this experience with the risen Christ. You've had it. I'm going to have it. 
That's how we should posture ourselves before the cross. Lord, I will not move from here until you deliver, until you pour out your presence on me. I want to see your presence. I want to feel your presence. I want to be just brought so on fire for you, Jesus. But right now my flesh is rising up. Right now my flesh doesn't want, want me to do any of that. Right now my flesh is thinking about something else. Football season's over, so it's not football, obviously. I don't watch basketball, so it's not basketball. It's probably food. But how many times have you been in your prayer closet? Or have you been in your quiet time? Have you been in your prayer time? And you, man, you can't stop thinking about the next meal. You weren't hungry. You weren't hungry before, but today you are before the Lord. Lord, here I am. I don't have many words to speak to you today, Lord. Here I am. I just want to be in your presence. And your stomach does one of those. <laughs> You're just like, oh, man, I'm hungry. All right, Lord, you got five minutes. Come on. Come on, Lord. You got to speak to me. Lord, you got to speak to me. Here I am. I want, I'm, I'm here before you, Lord. Would you just speak your word? Would you pour out your Holy Spirit upon me? Oh, man. 30 seconds, Lord. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, I guess you didn't want to talk to me. Oh, time's up. Got to go make myself some food. How many times have you been there? I've been there. I've been there. But look at what Thomas is asking. I don't want your experience. I don't want your experience. I want my, I want to experience him for myself. You saw his hands. You saw the, his nail-pierced hands. I want to see it. Thomas was not satisfied with just seeing, though. I started to mention it from a distance. You probably would have been able to see the marring on Jesus' body. You probably would have been able to see those, those impressions if, if the nail holes were still there. Listen, that crown of thorn wasn't just placed on his head gently. That crown of thorns was pressed into his head. It was stuck on his head. Our head has some of the most amount of capillaries in the entire body. Do you know how much a little nick in your head bleeds? For those of you who shave, not you. <laughs> For those of you who shave, you know what it's like to, to nick your face, and it just keeps bleeding. Some of you who have shaved your face have nicked yourself bad enough that you ha still have a scar. And that was just from a small nick. Imagine this crown of thorns being pressed into your head to the point where it's now, you're bleeding profusely from your head. But Thomas says, even if I see that, it's not enough. I don't, it's not enough. Maybe if I saw the nails in his hands. You know what? Nah. Not even that. Not even that. It's not enough just for me to see. I want to put my hands, I want to put my hands in the hole of his hand. Our Lord, his side was pierced with a spear. I want to put my whole hand in there. Only then will I believe. Think about the amount of intimacy this is talking about. Every one of us has had those experiences that have left us scarred. Every one of us has had those experiences that has cost us something so severe. Those of you who are actively serving the living, the living God, those of you who are pursuing ministry, you know or should know by now that it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you everything. 
Lord, let me go bury my parents. Let the dead bury the dead. Lord, let me go say goodbye to my parents. Who are my parents? I have no place to lay my head. I'm asking to leave everything behind. Our experiences, our encounters with the living Christ cost us everything, every worldly thing it's going to cost us. Consider this. Each one of the apostles paid with their life. Each one of the apostles paid with their life. Today when I hear somebody name themselves an apostle, and they're like, well, I'm apostle so-and-so. My question to them is, are you willing to give your life for Christ? Are you willing to be a martyr for the living Christ? If you're not willing to give your life, then you're not an apostle. Listen, every one of these apostles gave their life for the risen Christ. Thomas, the doubter, you know how he died? This doubter was proselytizing India. This doubter that has gotten a bad rap was speaking to a nation that had not one God, but thousands of gods. This doubter went into a place where he knew that if he went there, he would lose his life. And he was bringing people into salvation by the thousands. You know who it was that killed him? It was a Hindu priest. Because he was jealous. That this man had an encounter with someone so powerful. That this man was bringing thousands of people to the cross. That this man was, was bringing thousands of people into the kingdom of heaven and away from the kingdom of darkness. And so this Hindu priest kills Thomas. You had better believe that in your ministry, in your ministry, and each one of you is called to serve, you will bear the very marks that Jesus carried on his body. You're going to bear the, those marks. But I'm not, I'm not serving the Lord right now. I'm good. I'm good, right? I'm good? No, no, no. No, no, no. The moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ and you said, Lord, your life over mine. He says, look, these are my scars. I want you to carry them with you. Because wherever you go, they're going to testify about who I am. They're going to speak about me. And you're going to carry these scars. And the scars that you have will glorify me. What Jesus is asking isn't for someone to have a passive encounter. What Jesus is asking for is for us to have an intimate encounter with him. He wants us to have an intimate encounter with him. John 20, verse 26 through 27. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. This time, Thomas is with them. They're all gathered around again. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. You see, the, other, the others had experienced Jesus. The others had experienced Jesus. They had already seen his hands. They had already seen his side. They had already seen it. By this time, a week later, after Thomas was called a doubter, they had already experienced it. Tell me why, when Jesus appears before them, they're terrified. It's a ghost! Wait a minute. They had seen it. They had seen it. Paul doesn't say that. Follow me. Follow with me. 
Luke 24, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, same situation. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. Listen to this. But they were startled and frightened and thought they had, that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Now he's talking to the disciples, all of them. And why do doubts arise in your heart? I thought it was just Thomas who was the doubter. These disciples, all of them had had an encounter with Jesus. So why are they doubting? And he says, see my hands and my feet, that is, I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Guys, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a ghost, guys. Look, 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 see, see, look, look, right here. Touch it if you want to. You know what we're not told in this section of scripture? That any single one of them went and touched him. Thomas is not, is not easily swayed. He's like, nope, I'm going to touch him. I'm going to touch him. You guys are too scared to go touch him. I'm going to touch him. I'm going to touch him. The other disciples had heard. They had seen. They had stood before him and still did not believe. Jesus says to them, it's not enough just for you to see and it's not enough just for you to hear it. I want you to touch me so you know for sure that it's me. I want you to know for sure who I am. I want you to encounter me personally. Stop living for somebody else's beliefs. Stop living for what somebody else is telling you. I want you to touch it. Go ahead, touch it, because I need you to understand who I am. In this encounter, where Thomas catches a bad rap, he's already had his encounters with the other disciples. He's already talked to them. He's not even wasting his time with them anymore. He's not saying like, "Why, guys, you, a week ago I did the same thing. The exact same, guys, what's going on? I was here a week ago, and it's like I wasn't even here. I wasn't a ghost then, I'm not a ghost now. He's not wasting his breath. He's not wasting his breath. Instead, he walks into the locked doors. Oh, you guys are still afraid? That's cool. That's cute. Thomas, come here. Come here, Thomas. What did you want to see? Go ahead, touch it. Go ahead. Touch it for yourself. Go ahead. Put your hand in here. Feel it for yourself. Feel it for yourself. It wasn't just touch my hand. It wasn't just hold my hand. It was put your finger in the wound. I want you to feel the wound. I want you to put your finger in it. And I want you to know just how much pain that caused. Because I want you close to me. I want you close to me. Thomas, Now put your hand in my side. I want you to be intimate with me. I want you to know who I am. Go ahead, put your hand in there. Feel around. What do you think he was feeling? I'm going to tell you what you would feel if you put your hands in somebody's side. You're going to feel a lung. And you know what that lung is doing as he's breathing? It's expanding and contracting. If you've never held a lung before in your hand... It is an interesting feeling. And he's feeling the breath of God, the breath of Jesus. How much more intimate do you want it to get? Having said, I will not believe unless I touch him for myself, there is his hand inside of Jesus. And what does he say? 
my Lord, my God, it's you. You don't think he recognized him? You don't, this man walked with Jesus for three and a half years. You don't think he knew who Jesus was? Let me close with that. Yolanda, if I can get you up here for a moment. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, not Peter's Lord. Not John's Lord. Not Andrew's Lord. Not Matthew's Lord. Not Mark's Lord. My Lord. My Lord. There's his hand inside of his side. My Lord. My God. It's you. It's you. Today the Lord beckons you. Today the Lord tells you, like you, if you hear the sound of my voice, do not harden your heart. Some of you are carrying some incredibly deep wounds. Some of you are carrying some incredibly deep wounds that someone imposed on you. Someone violated your person and you've been unable to reconcile that hurt for years. And it's come out in the worst ways possible. Whether it's been a bad attitude, a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction, a pornographic addiction, continue to fill in the blanks. Because that wound is still there and it hurts. Some of you have endured significant religious abuse. And those injuries are ever present in your life. You are terrified to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Because someone from behind here abused their authority and abused the word of God. And when you walked out of that church, you said, I'm never going back. And the Lord to you today tells you, if you hear the sound of my voice, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. Look. Look at my hands. Put your finger inside. Know that it is me. But that's not enough. Put your hand in my side, he says to you. You see, your wounds cannot be resolved by somebody else's encounter. And today, and from this point forward, you know, if you didn't know before, you know now that you have been marked, eternally marked by the living Christ. You will never be the same. And as you bring your wounds to this risen Christ, who has conquered the grave. Listen, he conquered the grave. What in your life can he not conquer? But you don't understand. My parents were abusive. You're right, I don't understand. I don't understand. But you know who does? The one who has marked you, who has eternally marked you, he understands. Bring that abuse to the cross. Put your hand in his side and know how he's going to heal you. Pastor, you don't understand. Someone just like you said some very nice words to me. 
and then crumbled me up and threw me away like I was trash. And when I went to them for help, they ran me out of the church. You're right. I don't understand because it doesn't fit in my head how a pastor or a minister will stand behind the pulpit and abuse his flock. It doesn't make sense. But you know who does understand? The one who has eternally marked you. The one who has marked you and who will never leave your sight. And today he tells you, if you hear the sound of my voice, do not harden your heart. I want you to believe. I want you to believe. I want you to believe. He says, draw close, draw close, draw close. And don't live in disbelief. Don't live in disbelief. Believe. To the man whose son was convulsing, who was demon-possessed, he says, anything is possible for those who believe. To the ones who believe, all things are possible. Today, if you hear the sound of, the, of his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Don't live in disbelief. Draw in, press in, and believe. Believe, believe, believe. And if you are found like that father, Lord, I believe. Oh, God, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Lord, I'm falling apart, and if you don't send help, I'm not going to make it. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But it better, it's better for you to take his posture and say, Lord, I believe. Help my disbelief. Than to be found as an unbeliever. It's better to be found as Peter. Wait, the Lord is here? Oh, let me put on my dress really quick. Jump in that water and pursue after him. Forget what everybody else is saying. I'm going after him. It'd be better to be like Paul, who was struck blind by, the, by Jesus Christ. And to come to him and say, Lord, I believe. Oh, I believe. And be found with a repentant heart than to never have believed at all. Today, if you hear the sound of his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, if you hear the sound of his voice, do not harden your heart. He doesn't want a passive encounter with you. He doesn't want a superficial relationship with you. He wants you to take your hand and put it in his side. That's what he wants from you. Church, would you rise to your feet? <laughs> Father God, we praise you. We give you glory, Lord. You are a good God. And you allow us to examine your word. Lord, today, help us, those of us who are still found in disbelief, those who are still wrestling with your word. Could it be, Lord, that you are speaking to me? Lord, we know that you are speaking. Your voice continues to speak. It has never stopped. We refuse to yield to the enemy who wants us to believe that we're making stuff up. We press into your word, your written word. We trust, Lord, that you are still a living, breathing, active God. Lord, we don't want to live in a place where we live on somebody else's account or somebody else's experience that they had of you. We choose this day, Lord, to live out our relationship with you, Jesus Christ, that we would have an intimate relationship with you, the risen Christ. that we would be found in your hands. 
Holy Spirit, seal this word in your people's heart. Holy Spirit, would you continue to speak to us during the week and allow us to encounter you in a powerful way. That as we press in to you, Lord, that we would continue to hear your voice, that we would continue to see your word, that we would continue living out our life for you, the risen Christ. Lord, we praise you. We give you the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. From the church, thank you so much for worshiping with us. If today you are found in need, in need for prayer or any given need, find one of us, whether it's myself, Pastor Chris, uh, Julie and her husband, um, Pastor Marlene is somewhere around here, Victor's in the back. Find someone to pray with you. We would love to pray, pray over you and whatever your needs are, whatever your family, whatever the Holy Spirit is impressing on your heart right now. Above all else, receive from the Holy Spirit what only He can give you. Receive from the Holy Spirit what He has for each of you. And may His presence go with you throughout this week. I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a blessed week.